the Frey Bentos boys. Life inside a World War I Mark IV tank cross-section. Deep in the heart of one of the most difficult World War I battles, a tank carrying nine brave men survived for three days, stranded between a battle's two fronts. They left their mark on history as the longest tank action of the war. It was August 1917, and the now famous Frey Bentos tank and its crew were making their way through the Third Battle of Ypres, better known as the Battle of Passchendaele, at a not so speedy but very loud and bumpy three miles per hour. The nine man team was made up of Captain Donald Richardson, Second Lieutenant George Hill, Sergeant Robert Misson, and six gunners William Morey, Ernest Hayton, Frederick Arthurs. Percy Budd, James Binley, and Ernest Brady. Their battle station was the Mark IV tank that Captain Richardson had affectionately nicknamed Frey Bentos after the well-loved British tinned meat. This Mark IV tank, which entered service a few months earlier in May 1917, was one of the most prolific tanks of World War I. The Mark IV was the first British tank to be produced en masse, changing the scope of warfare forever. With thick steel plates cut, drilled, and hardened to be used for its 12 mm thick armor, the role of the male Mark IV tanks was to knock out pillboxes and machine gun nests. This is exactly what the Frey Bentos and its crew were attempting when they got fatefully stuck on the 27th of August 1917. After firing on the Somme farm, the tank ran into a ditch just after 5.45 that morning near their next target, Gallipoli Farm. Originally, Richardson had been walking alongside the tank to deflect enemy fire, but after receiving wounds in his legs, returned inside just in time for it to get trapped. Despite being stuck in the mud, all was not lost for Frey Bentos. The rhomboid-shaped tank had heavy armament that the crew could still use to fire upon the German army. Thanks to its two ordnance QF-6 pounder guns and three Lewis 303 machine guns, two of which were positioned in the Sponsons and one in the hull front. The crew also was carrying personal weapons that they could use for protection as they tried to unstick the Frey Bentos from the mud. Unfortunately, given the tank's position and the Germans who were in an old trench just in front, the Lewis guns were no good, aimed too low into the ground to help the tank's crew much. According to Misson's account, Hill, Bud, and Maury were hit as they went into the ditch through the very hatches designed for the crew to use to fire on the enemy with their personal weapons. Bud was knocked unconscious for two hours as the rest tried to rectify their newfound problem. First Sergeant Misson and Gunner Brady exited the tank under heavy enemy fire to fruitlessly try and dislodge the vehicle, using the equipment strapped to it. Feeling bullets ricocheting around him, Misson jumped back in the tank, but it was tragically too late for Brady. He was shot and his body fell under the tank and sank into the mud as his crewmates watched, unable to do anything. If things didn't look sticky enough for the Frey Bentos, the Allies on their own side also started sniping at the tank in an attempt to prevent the Germans from taking it and suspecting the crew dead or long gone. But they were still alive and willing to fight on. For a total of three days and two nights, the men of the Frey Bentos endured enemy fire and horrible conditions inside the 28-ton tank. It may have been a marvel of modern warfare and an effective weapon, but life inside was hardly peachy. Despite its armor, shrapnel still penetrated the hatches, injuring the crew inside in what were called sprays of hot molten metal. They didn't dare leave as they were experiencing enemy fire from all directions, and the Frey Bentos wasn't designed for prolonged multi-day attacks. It didn't have comfortable modern trappings like a toilet or even a water station. Instead, the men were forced to endure temperatures that could reach over 30 degrees Celsius or 100 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and drop below freezing at night. The only available liquid was from water in the radiator or filthy muddy water from where they were grounded. Having no other choice, that was what they drank in order to stay alive. Things were looking dire. At one point, a German soldier even succeeded in making it to the tank and dropped a grenade inside, which the British soldiers promptly threw back out. At around 7 p.m., over 12 hours since the tank first got stuck, with all but Binley wounded, Captain Richardson made an executive decision to tell Misson to head back to the British infantry and tell them to stop firing. 
If they were to get out of this alive, it wouldn't do to be shot by friendly fire just as they escaped the Germans on the other side. Of course, the Germans didn't get the memo and continued to fire on the tank for the next three days across the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th of August 1917. Above all else, the crew of the Frey Bentos were determined to do their duty and not let the tank fall into enemy hands. Any tank lost to the Germans would be a massive blow to their offense. Despite the war nearing its conclusion, the Germans hadn't focused on tank warfare and had none of their own to retaliate against the Allies. Instead, they focused on defense or repurposing those they captured, which was why it was imperative Frey Bento stayed out of their hands. But life inside the Mark IV wasn't pleasant. Putting aside the enemy fire, wounds, potential shrapnel, heat, and muddy water, a cramped tank wasn't a great living space at the best of times. The only place to sit was beside the 70-gallon engine and transmission. This meant that while in the tank, on top of everything else, the crew was assaulted by a cloud of gas, carbon monoxide, oil smoke, and cordite from shells that they inhaled every time they breathed, leading to nausea and long-term side effects. It was cramped and intimate and not in a good way, with the transmission noise so loud that the crew often had to scream at each other to be heard. In fact, braving the outside probably seemed less horrific in some respects, because at least the air was somewhat fresher. The fight with the weary Frey Bentos boys continued on until the 24th, when Captain Richardson decided enough was enough. After over 60 hours of constant assault, they would make a break for it back to British lines. Taking not only their weapons and maps, but unhooking and taking the Lewis guns also, the crew exited the tank at 9 p.m. August 24th forced to literally crawl on their bellies across the mud, the remaining members of the Frey Bento's tank crew, Sands Brady, slowly made their way to the British lines. Finally, after an arduous journey and a record-breaking extended siege in their tank, the surviving crew had made it. They encountered the 9th Battalion, also known as the Black Watch, who took the weary men in and tended to their multiple wounds. The battle for the Frey Bentos was over, and luckily, the Germans never succeeded in capturing the tank for themselves. All the men who had endured the three days inside Frey Bentos received recognition for their calmness and stoicism under heavy fire. Captain Richardson and 2nd Lieutenant Hill received the Military Cross, while Missin and Mori were awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal. The other members, Hayton, Arthurs, Bud, and Binley, received the Military Medal. Sadly, Bud didn't survive to see the end of the war, dying a year later, age 22. Captain Richardson went on to command another tank he lovingly called the Frey Bentos II, although it couldn't possibly live up to the legacy of its predecessor. The Frey Bentos II was captured and presented to Emperor Wilhelm II. At the end of the war, the affectionately nicknamed Frey Bentos boys were officially recognized as the most decorated tank crew, undergoing the longest tank action of World War I.